Mr. President, first of all, my warm greetings to all Security Council members. My greetings also go to Minister Shukri and my good friend, Ambassador Omar Sadiq of Sudan. Mr. President, as a founding member of the United Nations, Ethiopia's commitment to the principles and purpose of the United Nations Charter has been solid and consistent. It has always been a staunch supporter of the principles of collective security and multilateralism. Ethiopia's track record in this regard speaks for itself. It has always adhered to and actively supported and promoted these principles at regional and international levels. In its entire history, Ethiopia has never caused a threat to any country. It has instead been contributing to the cause of peace through its active participation in peacekeeping and peace building since the early days of the United Nations up until now. This said, let me be clear that Ethiopia doesn't believe the issue being discussed today has a legitimate place in the Security Council. It is bound to set a bad precedent and open a Pandora box. This council should not be a forum for exerting diplomatic pressure. As we have informed the council, the tripartite negotiation between Ethiopia, Egypt, and the Sudan has not yet been concluded. The three countries have in fact reached consensus on most of the prominent technical issues in the last rounds of the negotiation. That's why Ethiopia is of the few that progress at hand and a mutually beneficial agreement is within reach. Even if the three countries fail to resolve their differences on the outstanding issues, the, delegation, the Declaration of Principles DOP signed in 2015 by their leaders provides for dispute settlement mechanisms which are yet to be exhausted. Furthermore, the African Union has the necessary goodwill and expertise to help the three countries in bridging their differences and reaching a mutually acceptable solution. It is indeed lamentable, to say the least, that the principles of complementarity and subsidiarity between the UN and regional organization much talked about in this, country, in this council was ignored when the issue related to the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam was unjustifiably brought to, this, to its attention. It also contravenes Article 33 of the United Nations Charter, which stipulates that parties to any dispute, among others, shall first resort to regional agencies for arrangements. Members of the Council are, are aware that three days ago, as mentioned earlier, the Bureau of the Assembly of the African Union held an extraordinary meeting under the chairmanship of His, His Excellency President Ramaphosa. As stated in the communique issued on 27 June 2020, the three countries agreed to resume negotiation and resolve the remaining issues through tripartite consultation under an AU-led process in the spirit of pan-African solidarity and within the framework of African solution to African problems. Therefore, the African Union is now seized of the matter, and it's only appropriate that this Council allows the AU-led process to take its course. Mr. President, needless to say, the Nile is as important to Ethiopia as it is to Egypt and the Sudan as a source of livelihood and economic development. The GERD is conceived as the centerpiece of our national development aspiration. Ethiopia generates 86% of the total average annual flow of the Nile waters, but it has never benefited from the river at all. The 1959 agreement between Egypt and the Sudan has apportioned the entire waters of the Nile between the two of them, with Egypt securing the lion's share, leaving nothing, nothing for Ethiopia. That was the unilateralist decision to have ever been taken concerning transboundary rivers. In 1997, 
Egypt again took another unilateral decision and built the Toshka and the Peace Canals, taking the Nile water away from its natural course. Ethiopia has repeated complaints over this project since the mid-1950s fell on deaf ears. The first complaint was made by the government of Emperor Haile Selassie regarding the 1959 agreement. Egypt ignored Ethiopia's subsequent objections. Despite these historical facts, Egypt continues to accuse Ethiopia of taking unilateral action with respect to the building of the GERD, as you heard earlier. Mr. President, Ethiopia is not asking too much. It is seeking to correct past injustice and share this precious resource in an equitable and reasonable ma- manner. Despite being enrolled with abundant water resource in the Nile Basin for years, the people of Ethiopia have been deprived of their right to use the resource to escape themselves from abject poverty. This is why for Ethiopia, accessing and utilizing its water resource is not a matter of choice, but of existential necessity. The unfortunate reality is that today, in 2020, tens of millions of Ethiopians still use firewood as a primary source of fuel, with severe consequences to their health and the environment. All rural households, where 85% of Ethiopians live and nearly two-thirds of school children are forced to stay in darkness. This is a reality. By contrast, nearly 100% of Egyptian population, both in, in the cities and rural areas, have access to electricity. Therefore, Ethiopia believes that it has a national and moral imperative to do everything in its power to improve the lives of its people. GERD is an answer to Ethiopian mothers' cries for help so that they don't have to trek hours to collect firewood. The unfortunate reality is that pregnant mothers are still being carried on stretchers over a long distance due to lack of electricity to access life-saving emergency medical care. The image of young girls with back-breaking loads of firewood on their shoulders is also a daily reality. Once completed, the dam will generate 15,700 gigawatt hours annually, bringing electricity and an opportunity for a dignified life to more than 65 million people who currently live in complete darkness. That is why we are emphasizing again and again that GERD is a development project and it cannot in any way be a matter of security threat. If there is a security threat there to be discussed, it has to do with the fact that there are millions of Ethiopians living under the poverty line. The dam is meant to uplift these people And in a way, it is averting a potential threat rather than posing any. Seeking social progress and better standards of life for our people, leaving no one behind, is indeed consistent with the spirit of the UN Charter and the sustainable development goals that we all aspire to achieve in 2030. The GERD is also one of the mega projects envisaged under Ethiopia's effort to meet the African Union Agenda 2063. I should also underline here why the GERD is a people's project, which is being built by Ethiopians from all walks of life with an unprecedented deal and commitment. It is to be recalled that various obstacles were created to prevent Ethiopia from accessing international support. My government is just coordinating a public-owned, public-funded project. Therefore, it has a solemn responsibility to bring this project to accessible full completion. Mr. President, from the very beginning, Ethiopia took an unprecedented initiative to create understanding with both Egypt and the Sudan on the GERD by, among others, establishing the International Panel of Experts and the Tripartite National Committee to, the implement, to implement its recommendation and later the National Independent Scientific Research Group to formulate different scenarios and the first filling and annual operation of the gut. All this initiative failed to deliver the desired result because of 
Egyptian intransigence and its insistence on historic rights and current use. The reason why Egypt has been consistently engaged in scuttling the tripartite negotiation has more to do with its own internal situation than anything else. On the other hand, Sudan knows full well the benefits of the dam. Be that as it may, Ethiopia has been guided by the internationally accepted principle of equitable and reasonable utilization and not causing significant harm in building the dam. Ethiopia cannot harm Egypt and the Sudan through the dam because if to harm is not to release water, then building it in the first place would have been meaningless and purposeless. We are all the people of the Nile. Therefore, Ethiopia cannot harm Egypt without harming itself. The DOP clearly encapsulates Ethiopia's firm commitment to the principles of transboundary water utilization. In fact, Ethiopia's good phase efforts have been unprecedented in the history of transboundary rivers. It doesn't deserve to be mistreated. It should be instead be commended for demonstrating exemplary cooperation. Mr. President, in October 2019, at the request of Egypt, the United States the government invited the three countries to Washington, D.C. for consultation. Ethiopia responded positively in good faith and hoping that the presence of observers will help facilitate the negotiation. However, Egypt sought to impose an acceptable terms on Ethiopia by leveraging and influencing the process. Unfortunately, Egypt's actions, actions muddied the water even further. Throughout the course of the negotiations, Ethiopia has shown a great deal of flexibility in the tripartite process to build the necessary trust and confidence. As a demonstration of its good faith gesture, Ethiopia agreed to fill the good reservoir from four to seven years. Also, it could be filled in three years without causing significant harm to Egypt and the Sudan. Furthermore, Ethiopia agreed to postpone the second phase of the first filling if annual in inflow at the GERD is below 31 billion cubic meters. Mr. President, the three countries have already agreed on the initial filling of the dam. Luckily, Mother Nature is an agreement too. This year is an opportune time to begin impounding water in the Gerd Reservoir. Currently, both the Blue Nile and the White Nile have above normal flow. Lake Victoria is at a record high level. The High Aswan Dam is also at its full supply level of 182 meters above sea level, which is a record high for the past 40 years or four decades. During the first stage of the impoundment, which is a testing or a trial, Ethiopia will retain only about one-tenth of the average annual flow of the Blue Nile. By contrast, every year, twice the amount of the water retained during the initial filling of the GERD is lost to evaporation from the highest one down. This is in addition to the wastage through water-intensive flood irrigation practice in Egypt. Water is increasingly becoming a scarce commodity. More than 60% of Ethiopia's surface area is dry land with no sustaining water resources. Egypt, on the other hand, is endowed with plenty of groundwater resources and has access to seawater, which could be desalinated for use. Mr. President, in any transboundary water course, drought management is the joint responsibility of all riparian countries. But Egypt wants Ethiopia to shoulder the burden of drought alarm. Water use or dam operation rules are dependent on the availability of water. They depend on the almighty God. Hence, operation rules must have special guidelines, creating two different hydrological conditions, including drought. Therefore, the three countries must agree on drought threshold and cooperative mechanism for sharing the responsibility for addressing and mitigating any consequences of drought and climate change. Furthermore, Ethiopia believes that any future disputes arising from the use of the Blue Nile water should be resolved in line with the principles agreed 
to in the DOP, which provides for a mechanism that allows the three countries to address their grievances through conciliation, mediation, by referring the matter for the consideration of our heads of state and governments. Ultimately, Ethiopia believes any agreement must not in any way constrain its sovereign right to future use and upstream development on the Blue Nile. Mr. President, the involvement of the Security Council on this issue risks hardening position and making compromise even more difficult. And instead of pronouncing itself on this matter, the Council should defer to the African Union and encourage the three countries to return to the tripartite negotiation as the only means of to finding an amicable solution to the remaining outstanding issues. We also hope the Council would be cautious not to amplify differences and undermine the AU-led process. The statement we just heard from our brother, Minister Shukri, glaringly shows that the AU-led mechanism is seen in a very precarious situation. The statement casts serious doubt. In this moment this year, marking the 75th anniversary of the United Nations, I wish to recall a moment in history when another Ethiopian leader, Emperor Haile Selassie, spoke before the League of Nations to make a moral case against the scourge of colonialism and the invasion of my country. He wanted that. It is us today, it will be you tomorrow. The League of Nations, unfortunately, did little to hear that call. It would be regrettable if Ethiopia's call today not to politicize and internationalize the issue of the GERD is not heeded by this August Council. We can only hope that the Council will choose to be on the right side of history. For in a lot of ways, the matter being dealt with by the Council today is deeply rooted in a colonial legacy. Let me conclude, Mr. President, by emphasizing the fact that the Nile Basin country enjoy one of the oldest relationships in human history, as many of you mentioned earlier. The seeds of our common development were planted, not today, thousands of years ago. Our time-tested links through the Nile should provide us with the truth, trust, and faith to do what is just for the betterment of all of our peoples. The GERD offers a unique opportunity for transboundary cooperation between our sisterly countries. It should never be an object of competition or mistrust. In this spirit, Ethiopia will pursue an amicable solution through a win-win negotiation. We also seek the understanding of our brothers and sisters from Egypt and Sudan. We are confident that we will reach a cooperative agreement in the coming weeks under the AU-led process. The Council should defer to the African Union be cautious not to amplify, amplify differences and encourage the three countries to return to the tripartite negotiation as the only avenue for finding a lasting resolution. I thank you, Mr. President.